what is going on youtube it's pete coming in hot with another video also known as that guy pete you just refuse to invite to gatherings so as of yesterday the third tax dragon for the year has been slain one remains october 16th and then i get to breathe for two months and then more dragons on the horizon such is life this is what i agreed to when i became a cpa but anyway i digress i hope you are all doing well i've been hanging in got a lot going on yes i have been um the intervals between videos let's say have been longer i have noticed this of course um and it's just sort of a um an eventuality that that follows kind of what i have been saying for quite some time with my videos that we've pretty much reached a point where I have covered what I wanted to, I've made my contribution, but I do like to, you know, check in, do videos like this from time to time again, because that sense of community, um, it's very important to the subscribers. I know that. So I try to be mindful of that and make the time where I can. So take that for what you will. This is a Q and a video. So for those who have been here, for quite some time you already know the drill you know what i'm gonna do but for those of you that are new the way this works is very simple a couple days ago i did a q a post and said hey leave your questions i'll answer them to the best of my ability so on and so forth then i boot up the camera i start recording and in real time i react to the questions starting with the oldest question posted all the way up to the newest question posted i do not read the replies to the questions Otherwise, the videos would probably go way longer than they already are. And then when I get to the end, I hit the refresh. If there's any additional questions, I will answer it. Otherwise, we'll stick a pin in it and call it the end of the video. Simple enough, right? Great. So without further ado, let's jump in and tackle these questions. Beginning with Braveheart Production. Hey, Pete, want to keep this short and to the point. I'm in Germany right now, and I've decided to take this year and go hardcore mode on German. Keep in mind, I'm already at the intermediate level, but I want to see if I can reach an advanced level in the language in one year by going all out. This might be the last comment that you might see from me in a long time, but if you don't see any comments from me, you know why. Yes, learning another language is a very time-consuming thing. It's like going to the gym. It's like adhering to a new diet it's something you got to do every single day or everything that you learned up until the point where you're at you're just gonna fall off if you don't use it you lose it you, the brain folds are like hey we got to make room for other shit so i get it man you definitely need to dedicate the time but it's an it's an admirable goal and given that you live in germany it makes absolute sense that you pick up the language of the country you live in so that you can navigate the um, the intricacies and the nuances of the culture uh, more effectively. You know, we definitely talk about this um, in geomaxing a little bit. The um, the other side of it, like yeah, on the one hand, woohoo, passport bros, but on the other hand, like there's a culture there, there's there's a language there, there's things that obviously, if you make a conscious effort to, you know, learn that and let that grow on you, then obviously it's going to enhance your experience interacting with that culture for sure. Okay, next we got user ST5NC3PQ4H. I really hate that they don't just fucking have the names of the people and that they do this handle bullshit. It's like, bro, you're not Twitter. Just stop. What is your opinion on the androcentric black pill? Okay, so for those who have no idea what he's saying... One of the main talking points in the manosphere, specifically the red pill, origins I would say being the rational male, where like the concept really came to the forefront, is this idea of a gynocentric social order. The idea that basically society caters to the needs of the female, not the male. And I mean, when you think about it, men are hardwired to protect and provide and things like this. So it makes sense that the society, to some degree, to some degree, mirrors that. But basically, when you've beaten men into this emasculated state, 
you're only left with the uh, protect and provide portion of things. And that gives off this uh, image of gynocentrism, which I do believe that, yes, in a lot of respects, um, we do treat women like children. Example, court. Um, they get much more reduced sentences. Um, you know, they cry wolf. The court comes to a screeching halt, starts listening to what she has to say, even in the absence of evidence, you know, things like this. But that being said, there are those men who believe, okay, the counter to gynocentric culture, a gynocentric social order, is to basically um, do away with all the olive branches, handshakes, and stuff like this, and adopt a more androcentric stance. Basically, I'm the man, and I'm going to do what's in my best interest as a man. Yeah, I'm going to exercise to be healthy. I'm going to fucking eat to stay healthy. And instead of just dealing with women's bullshit to get sex, I'm just going to pay for it. That's the idea. I'm just going to hire a professional and I'm just going to interact with women that way to the extent that they fulfill my needs. And that's it. Right? That's the idea of androcentrism. Like, okay, fine. If I'm a sub five you know, you're probably going to put your pussy behind a paywall. So I got to pay for it. And there are many people in that position that are like, well, okay, I'll pay for it. Because you know what? It does cut through all that bullshit and song and dance that I would normally have to go through in the courtship process. And I can just, I can just get the booty and move on my day. You know, and I have told people who, who take this stance repeatedly that i'm totally in favor of legalized prostitution i have absolutely zero issue with it it's fine you know for example you know alcohol is legal i don't drink it but it's legal so hey you want to you want to have a party and drink some booze go ahead you want to go to a smoke shop pick up some marijuana go ahead so the way i look at it, it it's your life it's how you're living and to be honest it's probably your genetic proclivities that drive you to live life that way anyway so what am I going to do? Tell your genome that it's wrong? I mean, it just is what it is, as I always like to say. So, no, I have absolutely zero issue with androcentrism. I've said it repeatedly on this channel. So, again, if that is the derived solution to any problems you might have, hey, it's a solution. It's not for everybody, but it's a solution. Yeah. So definitely something that's an option on the table. So my opinion of androcentrism is that um, it's not my personal path, but it's an acceptable path. More than one way to skin a cat, as they say. Next, we got an empty shell. What's up, brother? Hope the tax dragons aren't too stressful. You don't know the half of it, man. Looking for life advice from my favorite New York sage once again. I'm definitely not a sage. An old soul, perhaps, but not a sage. It seems that my mentality and lifestyle got stuck in my teens when life was simple. Gaming, watching content, and not going outside very much, and loving every second of that life. And there's nothing wrong with that, man. Listen, you know, some think about it, right? If you're not staying at home doing things, what would you be doing? You'd be going out and doing shit. I like to say that there's vacationers and there's staycationers. There's people that, you know... Every weekend, they got to be out. They got to be doing something. Then you got people, it's like, every weekend, they just want to stay home and do nothing. And then you got most people who are kind of in the middle. Sometimes it's like, all right, yeah, let's go out and do some shit. I'm down. And then there's other weekends where it's just like, bro, I'm so fucking drained. Just let me boot up my Xbox. You know? So I get it. I 100% get it. And I don't think it means that your psychological growth is stunted, necessarily. There are plenty psychologically well-adjusted people who play video games and hang out at home on weekends sometimes. It's just people are like that. But what you're saying is that you really don't enjoy living like this anymore. You know you should move on since all this behavior doesn't serve me anymore, or at least not in this capacity. Yet at the same time, there's an internal conflict because changing and moving on to new things feels like leaving those days behind forever, devaluing the memories I've made and betraying the person I used to be. 
So a lot of people look at it like that, like they say like the old me, the new me, the this, and that's kind of shorthand, right? What we are is just an ever-changing, ever-evolving being. However, as we get older, the changes become fewer and fewer. And this is because of um, something that I've gone over on this channel, the, um, the personality assessment system. Basically, as a kid, your expression of what you could potentially be is at its most vulnerable in the sense that the environment can have the greatest impact on it. Teen years, slightly less, but it's still there. And then when you're an adult, pretty much at that point, uh, your core personality has crystallized and you are what you are. And whatever you may be, you know, whether it's a homebody or, a, you know, a travel bug, um, it's it's just there's nothing inherently wrong with either of them. You just you are what you are. But what I can tell you from experience is this. As you get older, right, you're going to take on more responsibilities. It's just the nature of the beast, right? When you're young, you're going to school. You're going to high school. You're going to college. College, I, I, college I always look at as um, um, putting off adulthood. That's kind of how I look at college. It's, it's just putting off adulthood. But then eventually you graduate from college, you got to get a job. All right. You got to have your own place. All right. Got to have a car so you can get around. All right. So basically you're getting all these things and now you got bills to pay and you got a job. All right. Then maybe perhaps, I know, given what we talk about on this channel, a lot of us probably think it's not likely for ourselves. But for some of you, I, w I have had married men on my channel talk. You might meet a girl. Okay, now you got a relationship. Add that to your job. All right. What if you get married and have a kid? Now you got kids. All right. Now you bought a house together. Now you got all this shit going on. What am I getting at here? What I'm getting at is, yes, these changes happen, but just because these changes happen doesn't mean you can't have your reprieve where you can play your video games. But if you think you're going to be able to play your video games and do all these things as much as you used to, yeah, that that's kind of where um the discrepancy might lie right the running joke is that every house has a man cave you know where the man can just kind of go to his nothing box and just kind of do his mindless activities i firmly believe men need this it's a way to decompress um you know women will always kind of nag you like you don't need video games you don't need this you don't need that and i think like the ones who who say that kind of stuff, they don't understand the purpose of that activity. It's an escape, yes, but it's also like a decompressing agent just to kind of get you psychologically even keeled again. But in this entire arc of a monologue that I just gave you, what I'm trying to get at is that you're not portraying your old self. It's just that you're changing. You're going through life changes. You're, you're doing new things. You're taking on additional responsibilities. But it doesn't mean that you can't play video games, you know? It just means that instead of playing video games every day, you're probably going to be playing a little bit on the weekends and stuff like this, and, and that's it. So don't look at it like you, it's a betrayal. Look at it like it's just, it's just a natural evolution of where life takes you. But wanting to put more effort into your skills, being more put together in general at this stage in your life, you feel like it retroactively makes it so that you wasted your teens and early 20s or something like that yes i have talked about this on my channel as well if there's one thing i could have done different it's that i would have been a cpa sooner but here's the thing my friend we do not have time machines <laughs> and because we do not have time machines there isn't jack shit that we can do about the teens and the 20s i'm in the 30s now so i'm trying to make the best of what i've got now and the sad thing is, even in the 40s, I'm probably going to look back at the 30s and still be thinking like, eh, I could have done something different because hindsight's 2020, right? But spending all your time looking at the past and like what could have been, no point. The point is you're here now and you kind of know what the fuck you're supposed to be doing to alleviate this feeling of like, hey, I need to have purpose. I need to be doing something. So put the time and effort into the skills and stuff like that and once you acquire the skills and you get to a point where you're comfortable trust me you're gonna have a little bit of free time especially if you're single you're gonna have the free time to play video games and do the things that you have grown up enjoying doing believe me 
that's not going to change um but yeah if you have a relationship or something like that yeah that's gonna that's gonna take some time away if you decide to go that route now i know that one time is a that time is a one-way street yep and the past is gone and done correct right in the same way that changing myself now can't change the precious memories of the good old days oh yeah i think i think thinking ape he just did a video about nostalgia right the nostalgia goggles right they make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside but the reality is those times are gone those times are gone it reminds me of a line from the from watchmen uh sally jupiter she was from the Minutemen, the original group from 1940. And she said she was looking at a picture of the, the Minutemen from 1940. And she said, sometimes the past, uh, even the grimy parts of it, look a little brighter when you consider what's coming in the future. Or something like that. So sometimes we look back at some parts of our past and we think like, eh, that wasn't really that great. But again, you kind of count your blessings that, that you had the life that you had up until this point. Uh, unless, of course, your life was so abysmal that it's just like, all right, no, I'd rather just not think about it. But, um, yeah, I think um, trying to emulate nostalgia from the past, it's it's like trying to um, it's like trying to time the market. It's just it's just I don't think it's um, it's effective. You know, people like me, right? I love Mass Effect. I love Halo. I like I like Shin Megami Tensei, I like Metal Gear, I like Gears of War. So sometimes what I do is even though I've played these games tons of times, I'll replay them just to go through that experience again. Um it's cope, of course, but that's about all you've got. It, you know, walking down memory lane if you will. Yeah. But oftentimes we still kind of help the way we feel even if it's irrational. That's true. Feelings are irrational. Thanks for reading my blog post. Not sure what the question really was. Just wanted to ask if you have some input or advice, perhaps. I've Again, just to kind of encapsulate it at the core, understand that as you grow, you're, you're going to take on more responsibilities, and those responsibilities are going to take time away from you personally. It just is what it is. And then when you get to retirement age, that's kind of when you get your time back a little bit. Though it's not really the same because I can't help but think about the people, the picture of like, it was like a boat in Venice. Like they were on vacation and two old people were sleeping on the boat, I guess. So it's not the same. I get it. But you find the free time where you can. But you don't let, again, your recreational activity take up so much of your time that it prevents you from proceeding forward in life, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's... A they, they say that the, the saying goes, it's only a problem if it d detracts from your ability to perform your responsibilities and so on and so forth. Yeah, like to fulfill your obligations to people that you entered agreements with. Even a job is an agreement. It's a contract, you know. So, yeah, hope that answers your question. Dio Brando says, sup, Pete, in your opinion, what is the least talked about aspect of the black pill? Because people always talk about stuff like height pill, looks maxing, etc. I would say most people don't touch dog pill with a 10-foot pole. For those who don't know what dog pill is, there's some girls out there that look at their dogs and go, hmm. <laughs> the same way boys who just hit puberty look at couch cushions and go, hmm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I would say that's the least talked about, but... Let's get to the point. But I feel like I don't see a lot of people talk about, I guess what you call it, speech pill, aka having a speech impediment and how that can really affect your mental health, dating life, etc. Because as someone who has a stutter, since I could remember, it really has affected my mental health and my self-esteem, which I am working on and has gotten better because beforehand, I didn't really take compliments well because in my, in my mind, uh, you know, having the self-esteem that you have, uh, you thought that they were just lying. And it didn't matter if it was from family, people from work, or just random people in general. But after a while, you just start to take the compliment at face value and think nothing of it, which has done wonders. Yeah, at the end of the day, you just gotta... If someone gives you a compliment, I, as someone who also struggles to take compliments, I've been told this, like, you're a hard guy to compliment. 
because I have this tendency to just beat myself up a lot and really impose like unrealistic expectations on myself. I can let go of expectations towards other people, but I can't seem to do that for myself. So I know what that feels like. But I would say the speech impediment aspect in general falls under mental cell. Okay. Usually when we talk about mental cell, though, we talk about in particular spectrum, Asperger's and autism, and how that can interfere with one's socialization skills. However, I would say something like a, uh, a speech impediment, like a stutter, does have the same effect, um, but it's, it's a different root cause in the sense that like, you probably do have like the social know-how in your head, like, hey, I know what to say in this situation, or I know what to do in this situation, while an autistic person or an Asperger's person might be a little behind the curve on the socialization aspect of things, despite being intellectually brilliant, let's say. But speech impediment is just like, hey, when brain sends signal to mouth to, to say things, like, again, I just, I can't help but stutter. It just, it is what it is. And in that situation, yeah, that could create a social awkwardness. And again, in the woman's ooga booga brain, what she's saying is, oh, um, speech impediment, stutter. If that gene passes on to my kid, my kid's going to have a hard time passing on the genes again. So, no. Are they actually consciously thinking this? No, it's back here. But that's like the underlying thing that drives them, even if they don't realize it. So on the plus side, it's good that it's improving. You're getting better. There's a lot of people, unfortunately, they don't really make much progress at all. They just live their whole lives like that. So if you are making progress on, on the uh, stutter, that's good. Um, but it's the cards you were dealt, so play them well. That's kind of, you know, all I could say on a personal level. But I would say in terms of where in the black pill this type of topic would be discussed, it'd probably be under the, the mental cells conversation umbrella. Uh, well, I would say the least talked about is dog pill. A lot of people don't want to touch that because, well, the namesake. It's, it's a pretty grotesque concept. I would say probably a secondary follow-up is genetic determinism because, again, the the determinism versus the free will argument, that's going to be an age-old argument that just goes on forever and ever and ever. Next, we have Alicia. Was wondering where you got to, but noticed you replied to a comment like a week or so ago. Good to hear from you. Same here. Victor Shul, happy to hear from you, man. Keep it kicking. Doing what I can, brother. Alan Chadwick, 373. Hey, Pete. Hope all's well. I have another question. I used to hold extreme political views basically Nazi socialist views, but I gave them up and no longer have strong opinions about society, politics, etc. I mean, I think most people who are aware, they kind of just have the two wings, same bird view. It's like, look, we know you're full of shit. They don't even try to hide it anymore, to be honest. Like they're so, as George Carlin put it, they're so stunningly full of shit. And like they think like we're stupid and we don't know but then i realized most americans in particular have an average iq of 98 so the way they look at it is like hey you know a bunch of higher iq and like more like aware people spreading shit around we'll just plaster conspiracy theory on that keep the conversation going so they're not focusing on us and basically most people and then at like you know that average iq range they're just going to take what the fuck these assholes say at face value and that's kind of where we're at but um you now have a live and let live attitude which i personally believe is the best attitude to have because most people out there they have no impact on my life until they do and if they do that is when i will deal with them but I gave up having radical opinions because I believe that if you have no kids and you're an incel, then why bother with activism or even care about external stuff if you have no stake in the ground or genetic legacy? That's kind of, again, I, I love referencing George Carlin because basically you're echoing his sentiments here. George Carlin basically said, when you're born in the world, you get a ticket to the freak show. When you're born in America, you get a front row seat. And he was kind of in a position where he thought basically modern society was circling the drain. It's just the last bit of water just circling around the drain and we're waiting for it to go down the drain. And he's just like, you know what? I have no stake in the outcome. I have no stake in the outcome. And I think he definitely felt this way even more after his wife died because no one to protect, no one to provide for. 
he was just kind of in a position where he was just like, you know, I'm just here to watch. I'm here to watch the freaks. And then he said his professional job was to to write about the freaks and talk about the freaks and make fun of the freaks for entertainment purposes. And that and that's kind of how he made his living, right? But again, it's true. I think if you're like a sub five where, again, as you say, you don't really have any investment in society. You don't have a genetic legacy because you don't have a girlfriend or a wife where you can have kids with them. I get it. And you rightly say, people with kids should fix the world's problems. Why? Because those kids are going to inherit the world. We're not. Right? That's kind of um, how we look at it. And you said that you realized most radical groups on the right or Islamic groups and red pillars like Tate followers, they're losers with women in the sense that they, they didn't get their pick of the women. And I'm glad you pointed out the Islamic groups in particular because in that region, there's, um, there's what you might call it, polygyny, multiple wives. So the guys at the top have multiple wives and then you have all these men who just, there's no women to go around. And they lose sense of purpose, so they find it in extreme causes. Yes. Um, so that's definitely something to be mindful of. But to conclude, is it a reasonable position to just live and let live? I would say yes. Why should I make a better world for Chad's offspring when he doesn't care and is smashing my looks match? So, yeah, I would say why invest in another man's offspring, period? I would say no. That's why you don't date single moms in... I would say an overwhelming majority of cases. Uh, because again, it's not my job to raise the chat cream pie. No, I agree with you. Absolutely. That, that's that's stupid. It doesn't make sense. And ladies, again, this is why, again, in the man's ooga booga, that body count shit matters. Because again, even though you have things like birth control and condoms and stuff, his ooga booga is what it is. You're not just going to magically change how the male brain evolved with a few scientific innovations. It's just not going to happen. But basically, his the signal in his brain is saying, oh shit, might have to raise some of the dude's kids. Fuck that. Abort. 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 Get out. <laughs> That's basically what his brain is saying. But I don't think these are weird questions. He's like, he's like but I've gone from a hateful Nazi to pretty chill. Yeah, let, I think like honestly, a lot of those... Um, a lot of those groups, they, they do come from a place of anger. They come from a place of envy. They come from a place where they feel like they've been wronged. And let me tell you something. There's no shortage of people that feel they've been wronged in the world. Okay? But the conversation is always going to come back to internal locus of control versus external locus of control. When we say internal locus of control, we mean given the genetic predispositions in my wheelhouse and how that's been activated and deactivated by the environment around me up till this point in my life, what cards do I have to play where I can actually do something actionable to improve my situation? That is internal locus of control. Now, so forget the whole, hey, the genetics and the environment together is what determines my ability to even do something in the first place. All right, that's neither here nor there. That's a black pill conversation we've talked about already. The point is, because of those circumstances, we can do something about this particular aspect, which we dub internal locus of control. And then there's stuff, external locus of control, we can't do shit about because we just don't have the cards to do anything about that. That, as the great Buddha said, let that shit go. Let it go. So I agree with your approach to live and let live on these external locus of control things. But never lose sight of the cards that you do have in the deck and what you can play and play those to the best of your ability. Okay? So, yes. Guy now, so something in this logic. Tails did a good video on this, by the way, titled A Better World for Chad's Offspring. So just you watch it. I now just focus on money, maxing health, and family. True. If you don't have your health, you have nothing. So taking care of your health, taking care of your resources, and taking care of your tribe, your family. Admirable goals. I respect it. Citramate. Hi, Pete. 
woke up on the 21st of August and for whatever reason, stopped caring that I was single. I think as our hormones decline, it gets a little easier to accept that, right? It's a very sudden emotional change and I felt the same since. It's been incredibly freeing and it was like all the knowledge in my head had finally flowed into my heart. Your feelings match your logic, yep. My thoughts and emotions were finally aligned on this issue. I have felt really happy since then. I'm not 100% done with women, but it's like I know I can live a 7 to 8 out of 10 life while single rather than depending on a woman to give me anything more than a 6 out of 10 life. Looking back with this emotional change, all the women I've dated didn't have enough going on for them that would have made my current life better. I don't think it's much of a perspective shift, but more of a reprioritization of things that make me happy. And I always say that too. I believe that if a woman is going to be in your life, she should make your life better than it would be if you were on your own. And if she's not doing that, or worse, she's making it actually worse, you're in the wrong place. But I do think, whether you're a man or a woman, in a first world country, especially, where you have the luxuries to kind of put the evolutionary shit on the back burner because of like oofy doofy innovations, what I would say is you want to be in a position where you don't need the other person to have the 6 or 10 out of life or better right? But let's say you have an 8 out of 10 life and the girl can make you have a 10 out of 10 life. You want her in your life because just simply you want her in your life. You don't need her in your life. If she leaves your life, you're back to 8. And 8 is still pretty damn good. But she makes it 10. She makes it better. You want. A want is, I would say, a little bit healthier than a need. For these types of things, in my opinion. But let's get to your questions. So, I'm wondering if this sudden change happened to anyone else. Was it sudden or was it gradual acceptance for most people? I believe that this is a gradual process. And I think the more that your hormones, like the do it, do it, do it, fucking do it, the more that kind of goes like this, um, the easier it becomes because your ooga book is like, all right, like you're not you're not using the hormones. We'll stop producing them. Like, all right, whatever. But um, I do think it's a gradual process. I do think it's a gradual process for sure. As a big part of not really caring anymore, I'm also taking the steps to become a sperm donor so I can secure my genetic legacy. Still need all the checks to ensure I'm eligible, but on paper, I'm the type of guy they're looking for, especially since my country doesn't pay you for donating. Be careful, though. I don't know what your country's stance is on the women suing the sperm donors for child support, but I've heard stories of that happening. So I don't know. If there's any precautions you can take, I recommend you do. Question, what are your thoughts of people taking the path of donating sperm to secure their genetic legacy? I think I pretty much just said it. I personally would not donate my sperm. I just wouldn't. Um, but that's just me. Like, I'm in a position now where I want my genome to die with me. That That's where I'm at. And I think a big part of it is kind of what, um, I think it was, yeah, it was what Alan was talking about. You know, I honestly don't want the responsibility of making the world a better place, man. Because I look at this world, it's like, it's just, it gets worse by the day. I don't want to be charged with the responsibility to fix that. And by having kids, in a way, you kind of are indirectly charged with that shit. But um, that's another talk for another time. All right, what do we got? We got Max Simon. You can love or understand women. One of Stardust's latest videos this year was put to the test by me. A MGTOW. When a woman at a poker table liked me, and I found out after three years. Been MGTOW for six years, and alone for ten, and in my thirties. I'm as MGTOW as Stardust, and I didn't trust Herd Flinging Monkey or Sandman, who have admitted red pill relapse during dating. So, I wanted to test male mother need, hope and validation. So, male mother need is kind of like, again, this need to have that female nurturing presence in your life as a man. And the woman who provides you with that 
you kind of have like this image of her in your head like, oh, you know, she's angelic, she's unique, kind of that one-itis setting in. She's the only one for me. When the reality is there's many who could fulfill that role. It's just which people are you willing to put up with the bullshit for? That's kind of, I, I think it was Bob Marley who said it. You know, who are you willing to suffer for, as the saying goes? But you let yourself get close to her. A great girl in many ways, truly genuine and loving. Well, that's good. Her feelings have been close to love now, I assume, after six months, and I let her call us partners, but she doesn't know I am a MGTOW. This month it will end, as my feelings haven't gone past liking her after two months right up until now. Yeah, <clears throat> so I would say probably within like the first two months, like, I would say, yeah, the, the feelings get stronger and stronger and you grow closer as you do more things together, you, you care more and more and more as you spend more time and then probably yeah around like the four to six month mark i think you should know like the despite female nature or anything it's like okay what does the um the mammalian part of your brain not the reptilian which knows the female nature and the ooga booga and all that shit the mammalian which is like the emotional regulation the feelings and stuff like what does that tell you it sounds like it's not telling you love but Love is really just shorthand for like, hey, this is the girl I want to protect, provide for, lead, so on and so forth. Like, I want to give her those things. Love is just kind of our shorthand way of saying that. While for women, I guess it's the shorthand way of saying she wants to nurture, she wants to caretake, she wants to give those experiences to her man and so on and so forth and take care of him. Love is shorthand for this. And you're saying that at the six month mark, you're still not feeling this, it sounds like. When I, I would say definitely around the six month mark, you, sh you should be feeling that. If things are going as they should be. So I see the female nature all day. You, w once you see this shit, you can't unsee it. That's true. The cost in money, $10,000 and time too. Yeah. Like, as I was saying to someone else earlier, when you're in a relationship, again, there is unspoken responsibilities, if you will. And responsibilities tend to take away from your time. But in a healthy relationship, you acknowledge that it's taking away from her time as well. And you're spending the time together and so on and so forth. But it does take away from your personal time. It does. Now... I can't be tempted when awake, even after going against who I am, to give this test a try for the benefit of Stardust Competes community. I consider her the clear good person in this situation, and myself the bad one if I let it go any longer. I tried to break it off four times in the first two months, but I let it go for six to determine how true Stardust theory was. I have genuinely tried to like her more last four months. But it doesn't work well, and we really suit each other. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I think there are. I think it's just a function of again genetic proclivities in combination with environment. There are some genetic environmental mixes that they can sort of purple pill it and make it work, and then there's some people where it's like, nah, I, I can't. I just, I, I can't. And it sounds like you're in that, that second category. Okay. Last six months have been scary as I watched my time and money disappear. It's personally reckless, but I have an answer for life now that I know I or Coltine or Stardust have the strength to do. Um, so yes, yeah. You always, as, as my mom likes to say, you got to pay yourself first. So when the paychecks come in, yeah, you pay your credit cards, you pay all that shit off. And you put some money aside, whether you got a brokerage account, a high yield savings account, just put money somewhere. You have to. Yeah. It doesn't hurt to have some side hustles as well, if you can find the time for that. Um, I was going to say, if, if she was a real like ride or die, she might do the side hustle with you. But it sounds like you're already checked out. What do you think, Pete? Do you think you can love after removing male mother need, etc.? Or just that one cannot live like a blue-pilled guy again. So 
when you're saying remove male mother need, basically if you if you um, kind of have like this intuitive mental state where you don't see value in a woman being nurturing and caring and stuff like this, like the feminine things that we usually look at, like can you love a woman if that has been become effectively worthless to you? Basically, if anything women bring to the table is effectively worthless to you, I would say no, right? Because what do we look for in women usually? We want a woman who's attractive, of course. We want a woman who is not a hoe, of course. Um, we want a woman who is feminine, yes. And that's kind of where the nurturing, the caretaking and all that stuff, cooking, cleaning, all that stuff. Again, women, some women, especially the feminist women, they look at that as servitude. But the way men look at it, it's a woman expressing her appreciation for her man. Like, I give a shit enough about you that I want to do these things for you. Just like if someone breaks into the house, the man says, I give a shit enough about you that I'm going to go confront that guy. I'm going to go out and get resources for the household. Things like this. Because he cares enough. Because if he didn't give a shit, he'd be like, get the fuck out of my house. <laughs> And then obviously having aligned values and stuff like that is the last thing you're looking for um, in addition to everything else. So basically, right, if you are in a position where you've already in your head were like, well, I don't really care about the sex. So the hoe thing is out the window. The, the attraction thing is out the window because the sex, you're just like, all right, my hormones are already down. I don't care. And then on top of that, the companionship, the nurturing, the caretaking, and the feminine energy, if that effectively is worthless to you via the killing of this male mother need, then yeah, I would say, how could you possibly love someone if you don't value those things? And I'm not saying that like it's your fault hmm, that you don't value those things. That's just the natural, logical conclusion given the path in life that you have walked. But I would say if you still have value for such things, then yeah, it's possible to still love a woman. That is, it's still possible to have the mammalian brain tell you, yes, I feel these things for a woman, of course. But at this part of your brain, you're always going to have that female nature. Like knowing that she can end this for any reason at any time, just because. And that's part of the risk of entering a relationship is that you have to risk that really shitty feeling if she decides to change her mind. You just make sure you put yourself in a position where you don't sign a contract or anything like that that could make it cost more in other ways that are more tangible. A little heartache, you know, as a man, you should be able to handle that. I'm not saying it's easy, but yeah. So I think for me in Stardust, it can't happen despite options there. I feel lonely around them and can't take care of my parents or nephews like I want to. By the way, she's a catch for another guy for sure. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I would say that if you do feel more alone in a relationship than you do by yourself, that's a problem. Like if you're laying in bed and the girl's laying in bed with you and she's cuddled up against you and you feel absolutely nothing... Mm, that's a problem <laughs> that's a problem but again on the flip side i think you went into this relationship from the very beginning looking at it like an experiment instead of a life experience and i think because you kind of had such a clinical approach to the whole thing um the the idea of as maybe shorthand way of saying it your heart was never in it kind of thing your mind was in it but your heart wasn't in it but i can't say for sure if um if you changed your demeanor if that would change anything but <clears throat> i think at the core of it it's whether or not you value the things women bring to the table if you're at a point where you're like i don't need that shit it's worthless to me now basically the male version of i don't need no man then i guess you're going to be in that position where you'd rather be alone than be with someone that doesn't make you feel like hey this person enhances my life. Mm -hmm. Next, Sargo. Hey, man, I was just thinking the other day about sending you an email to check on you and see if you're okay since we haven't heard from you in a while. Been busy. I've been sucked black back into the nihilistic valley once again, thinking there's no point to me being here if I can't attract a woman and have a family one day. Yes, the 
The two main biological drives are the drive to survive and the drive to reproduce. Combine them and you want to like simplify it. Survive long enough to reproduce. That would be like the overarching one biological imperative. Taking my strong and weak points into account, I'm a solid four out of 10. So basically a normie light. And I'm basically invisible to women. Yeah. Realistically, I'd be happy with my looks match. A 4 out of 10 woman or a slim 3 out of 10. But I can't understand why those women don't go for their looks match. Social media. Perhaps it's globalized hypergamy. Yes. Telling all women their intents. Exact, that's fucking exactly what it is. Those sub-5 women can't get commitment from guys that are 6s or 7s that pump and dump them. Yep, but that's their first choice. That's In their mind, that's their first choice. I don't know how women can't have a logical conversation with themselves and come to terms with their real SMV. Ego. One thing women hate more than anything else is social disapproval, and rejection is the ultimate form of social disapproval. The reason why is because the Ooga Booga brain says exile is the end game when you are rejected and no longer deemed valuable to the tribe. A man has the hunting skills to survive on his own. Women were never taught those hunting skills en masse by comparison. And as a result of that, they're pretty much fucked. So that kind of bred throughout the generations. Avoid that danger. Avoid that social disapproval. Because reputation back then could mean a death sentence. So let's look at this a little bit. Let's unpack it. The reality is this, and I think I understand why a lot of women hold the view that a hoe can become a housewife. It's because they spend their younger years trying to turn pimps into husbands. Think about it, right? Chats, what are they? They're fucking players. They're pimps. Tinder's the game of pimps and hoes. That's what it is. And you got girls willing to be hoes for these pimps, thinking like, hey, I'm going to be the bottom bitch that turns him into a husband. The problem is that just never happens. It never happens. But I think the guys who live as players, womanizers, pimps, whatever you want to call them, those, I always say this, they stay in their lane. They knew that they could never be husbands. They knew that they were not built to be husbands. But here's the thing. Women out here are trying to get with these pimps and then by virtue of trying to get with these pimps and turn them into husbands, they become hoes. And then the problem is that when they try to become wives later, the men who have the mind to become husbands are looking at them like, uh uh, you ain't it, girl. Go back to the pimp. And that's it. You know? So that's so that's a big part of it too. Once the girls enter that like um that Chad pump and dump churn and burn situation, as far as I'm concerned, they're lost. They're lost. They're not wifey anymore at that point. So it's like, you're not really losing much by diverting your attention from the women that you describe here. You're not losing much. But beyond that, what I will say, again, you live in a first world country where oofy doofy innovations do exist. A lot of copes. There's a lot of copes, man. In cave people days, there weren't a lot of copes. But in modern times, there's a lot of copes. A lot of things to keep yourself busy. Um, to deal with the fact that dumb luck has not struck yet for you. Now, that being said, it's not going to come knocking on your door, of course. But while you're living life with your copes, you are still putting yourself in situations where the potential to be exposed to women does exist. Women who aren't on social media. Women who aren't on Tinder because they're too busy out there doing shit. That option does exist. Just putting that out there as a side note. But the reason why women can't come to terms with their real SMV, social disapproval. They're petrified of it. Laser focus. Hi, Pete. Since you're an avid reader and also a gamer since a young age, how is your eye health? Surprisingly good. I do not need prescription glasses. My mom has prescription glasses. My brother has prescription glasses. And my dad had prescription glasses. So I fully anticipate needing them at some point in my life. But when I do get to that point, oh yeah, we're gonna go for style for sure. <laughs> like we're gonna we're gonna have glasses that that complement the face shape. So I'll I'll just be a um I'll be a nerdy that guy Pete instead of a standard package that guy Pete. 
So no, I don't wear contacts. Um, yeah, and I guess my eyes being what they are right now, dumb luck. I suppose you could eat your carrots and take lutein that as a supplement. That'll help prolong it, but yeah. That's all I've got, man. George D fifty four twenty. When will you be having a discussion when thinking ape again? Well, he says next month, hopefully. So yes, I I am hoping soon, but ultimately it's at his discretion. But yeah, I, I do like having chats with thinking ape. We always have very lively discussions, and um, yeah, his sub seem to like it. So yeah, hope hopefully we get to talk in the next month. Crowleyan says greetings, Pete. Long time no see. Good to have you back. I've hit my late 30s, and I've oddly enough found my standards for women, both in looks and personality shared interests, they've actually gone up. Well, yeah. If you have more to bring to the table, you get to ask for a higher price tag. Supply and demand, market equilibrium, baby. As in, it's just not worth the hassle to try to date what I'm currently capable of attracting. But be mindful of the fact that the reason why you're currently capable of attracting what you're capable of attracting it's because the internet has warped their sense of standards. You know, you kind of have to find those girls who aren't incessantly posting on the gram. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying they can't use the gram. They can't use TikTok. But, like, if there's a difference between the girl who just is scrolling and looking at random shit. Kind of like what you and I might do. Scroll through YouTube and just look at random shit. There's a difference between that and then the girls who are, like, posting their ass pics and shit like that on the internet you know just two different kinds of girls there so you got to be mindful of that because obviously the um the former the one not doing that might be a little more grounded in reality um but yeah unfortunately the internet permeates everything we do so yeah i'd rather stay home and listen to music or play video games or go to a concert alone and drink craft beer in a strange city there's nothing wrong with that. Instead of going on another mediocre date with a 4 out of 10 girl that will likely just ghost me anyway. Dude, I get it. I get it, man. It's like, girl, like think about it. It's a chick. She's a 4 out of 10 and she's acting like a dude. Like, she's ghosting you. Like, what? Like, dudes are supposed to ghost. What the fuck? <laughs> Obviously, if, like, you know, you're a psychologically well-adjusted guy with a with a uh, serious relationship mindset and she's the same way with a serious relationship mindset no ghosting is probably happening at all um because you're both serious but again you know probably just those four out of ten girls are looking for something different from what you're looking for but the thing is i still have a high sex drive for really attractive women that's the yoga booga fighting with the mammalian and I know I need to put in extreme work in looks maxing, maxing and possibly even geo max in order to get them. The black pill made me realize it was my looks and not my personality that made really hot women unattainable. No shit. Assortative mating. Absolutely. In my late 30s, it feels like now or never. Yeah. Pretty much. It's like I'm just waiting for that final push to either begin ignoring women entirely or focusing 100% on my effort into obtaining a quality sex life. If you were in my current position... Which path would you choose? My position would be entirely driven by my genetic environmental mix, which baked into that is my emotional predisposition. So I would say, admittedly, you know, the idea of a relationship with a quality woman is not a bad one, right? So if there is a location where such a quality woman does exist, and I was really wanting it enough, then the geomaxing option wouldn't be the worst option. But just bear in mind, as I've said already, you got to take on the culture. You got to learn the language. Otherwise, you're kind of half-assing it. And half-assing is a bad foundation for a relationship, especially when you're going to travel around the world to, to get to. Um, but me personally, I never felt like I wanted the relationship enough, like, like the idea like actively searching where I felt I needed to get on a plane and go somewhere. I personally never felt that way. Doesn't mean I'm not open to, to the idea of, um, of relationships, you know. But the reality is that the want, just as my default state, was never that intense. 
Um, but I always knew that like, if I was in a relationship, it's because I wanted to be there, not because I felt like I needed to be there, you know? So I would say in your shoes, I probably realistically would have just fucking kept playing video games and shit like that. That's probably what I would have done if I'm being completely honest. But again, the hormones are what drive you, my friend. So the question is, how badly do you want it? Is it? Do you want it badly enough to get on a plane? Really ask yourself that question. What it involves, picking up a language, getting on a plane. Do you want pussy that bad? Yes or no? I think pussy in and of itself is an insufficient motivator to get on the plane. But for some guys, that's enough motivation. You know, it's the oldest motivator in history. But um, I would hope that something of more substance would be the motivator before you buy that plane ticket. Leslie B says, just when I thought I was actually going to achieve the goal of no sim September, I see your post. Well, there goes that goal out the window. Brace yourself for some pent up fimping from me in the comments section of this upcoming Q&A. In all seriousness, just glad that you're doing well. Thanks, Leslie. Proud American, what's your predictions on Gen Alpha? Will they have a shitty dating experience like Gen Z and the Millennials? Probably. Probably. I, I guess it really depends on um, societal attitudes. Like if we kind of swing back towards something akin to conservatism in terms of uh, how these kids grow up, then maybe it might change. And we'll have more healthy pairings. But I think with the single motherhood and all this shit still kind of going through the roof, I think it's just going to get worse. MGTOW Monk, why do black pill doomers love misery? After taking the black pill, why can't they move on from how bad their looks are and instead focus on some hobby to cope? Why do they have to continuously suffer and drag other MGTOW men down? So my question for you as a MGTOW is, if you feel that way about what black pillars talk about, why even go to the forums and read that content in the first place? Why even watch the videos in the first place? Here's the thing, right? A lot of people in that incel black pill area of the manosphere, they're sub fives. I'm assuming that you're a normie. I'm assuming you're an average looking man. So as an average looking man, you can go to the gym. You can get a haircut. You could take a shower with some tactical soap. You can go make some fucking money, get your status up. And you might be able to gen generate genuine desire from a woman. You might be able to do that. And that's fantastic. I think, honestly, that's the standard fare as the majority of society is normies. But in the black pill spaces, you have primarily sub fives with some normie lights who probably think they're sub fives and even some normies who think they're sub fives because they have low self-esteem hanging out in this space, sharing their experiences as men who have been collectively shunned by women, if not outright mistreated. A very different experience from you. So someone like you who may not have had a comparatively bad experience compared to them could probably take the black pill information and more easily process it, more easily accept it, and move on. But pretty much the sub five who's reading his life story on the screen as he's learning about these black pills, he might hang out in the nihilistic valley a little bit longer than you might. And some guys don't even get out. Turd Fling and Monkey calls these people better off blue, right? It's better that they never knew because now the effect of unplugging on their genetic environmental mix has been so detrimental that now they cease to be able to function effectively in society. Okay, so it's not that these people love misery. It's that they're stuck in the nihilistic valley and they, they don't know how to get out. So what little solace they can find, they find it by talking with other people who are in the trenches with them in this valley. But to somebody who's not in the valley, it just looks like a bunch of crabs in a bucket. But that's not what it is. Am I saying that the crabs in the bucket don't exist? That there aren't people like that? There's so many different personality combinations on the planet. Of course I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is chances are these people that you call doomers, they don't love misery. They don't love the cards that they've been dealt. But they're just reaching out into the cyber aspect of the world, just trying to connect with someone who shares their experience. And that someone is not you. 
So from your perspective, you look at it like, oh, they're dragging me down. When really all you have to do is disengage with the information. And that's it. Nightingale says, hi, Pete. Nice to see you back. Just a quick question because I don't speak English very well. How can one escape the nihilistic valley alive, hopefully? So as we were just talking with the second thing, unfortunately, some people don't get out. However, it always comes back to the foundation that I've previously discussed, internal locus of control versus external locus of control. Take actual stock of your genetic environmental mix. What the fuck am I talking about? What cards do you have? What do you look like? What's your financial situation? What's your social standing? What's your living situation? Like, really take a bird's eye view snapshot of your life and look at the cards, the resources, and everything that you've got going on. Really take stock. And given that stock that you got, what are some actionable items that you can actually move on right now, given those cards? And on the same token, be mindful of the external locus of control stuff outside and stop looking at those things as some sort of daunting task that you actually need to address. You don't have the cards to address this. So on that particular aspect, disregard it entirely. Disregard it. There's nothing you could do about that aspect. And I think when you cut off the fat that is external locus of control, the weight on your shoulders lightens up a little bit. And you kind of have a better sense of what you actually can do and focus on that. That would probably be um, my advice. But even then, for some, the internal locus of control weight can still be too heavy. So I understand that as well. Okay. But just understand there's no guarantees. Okay. But the key to getting out, I would say, is acceptance. And acceptance goes hand in hand with this internal external locus of control dichotomy. Accepting it for what it is, because the harder you push against it, the harder it's going to push back. And it's just going to weigh on your mind even more and more and more. And you don't want that. Yeah. Jordan Troy says, hi, Peter. Glad to see you back. Quick question. Are Black Pillars right when they say that the chat is monopolizing the market? 90-10 principle and the reason average dudes like me can't get a girlfriend? Because in my humble opinion, most men and women are in relationships. Perhaps it's demographics, less women than me, and the fact that average guys aren't needed anymore. What do you think? Excellent question. So let's talk about it. Way I see it, there's two markets, okay? There's pimps and hoes and there's husbands and wives. Oversimplification because nowadays we got couples that they don't legally get married, but fine. We'll call it life partners. Pimps and hoes. Life partners. You go on the internet, the represent the representation of what you're seeing on the internet, whole lot of pimps and hoes. <laughs> Tinder, Hinge, Bumble, Instagram, TikTok, you're just seeing the most ratchet, thotty shit. I was watching the, M the MTV VMA Awards. Oh my God, the performances were so fucking ratchet. This shit permeates everywhere, okay? So when you're seeing... Again, primarily girls that got ran through, hoes, complaining about the pimps that will never be husbands. They inadvertently turn themselves into something that can't be marketed as a wife. And that kind of puts them in a, in a sh shitty predicament. Okay, So what I can tell you is that those pimps at the top, the top like 10% that are like legitimately pimping out here, <laughs> running rotations and shit, those guys are monopolizing this particular type of woman. The rest of women and men, there is some sort of assortative mating going on, but the effectiveness of that assortative mating has been warped by social media, which means there's pairing off still going on, but probably the type of pairing off where the guy is slightly better looking than the girl a good chunk of the time probably where the girl's better looking than the guy a minority of the time and still decent majority i would say where they're similar looking looks matched similar in social background and status similar in financial background and so on and so forth but all that being said 
I think it's the warped sense of entitlement from social media. So women who use a lot of social media, those are going to be the ones that you're going to have a hard time getting with. But yes, a lot of the women out there that are in relationships, probably the good catches. The good catches get caught quick. They go off the market very, very quick. But I would say that based on the statistics, I think it was like 60 plus percent of men between 18 and 30 in America are single. So most men are not in relationships. Though I do believe that, what was it? It's like 25% coming up to, it's coming up on one third of women end up never pairing off at all. So it's like a third of women that just remain single and probably just stay on the CC. Um, I would say there's definitely a lot more single people than there have ever been, but there's still a decent chunk of people who are in relationships, sure. But we're seeing an increasing majority of young men in particular that are single, right? Which seems to imply that if there's fewer women who declare themselves single, because women tend to look at relationships in a more nebulous sense, situationships, they might call it a relationship, even if it's really not a relationship. Like I said, it's kind of a situationship. What you're seeing is you're seeing a lot of hoes sharing pimps. The hookup culture, it's become a very pervasive and, and popular way of dating, unfortunately, for good or ill. So the more archaic modes of dating, they, they're kind of taking a back seat in modern times. But again, if there's fewer single women on paper than there are single men on paper, it implies women are sharing men. That's what it implies. So I would say that the monopolization in terms of peak is probably happening like on the dating apps and stuff like that. But there's a little bit of polyamory going on outside of that, but it's a much smaller slice of the pie. Um, and then I would say, yeah, there's probably a decent swath of couples that are just monogamous pairing off like so. Um, but yeah, the idea that average guys aren't needed anymore, that's a function of the first world comforts we have, right? But if you take away all those first world comforts, they will need us. But that's another talk. Thinking Ape, he's alive. Where do you think your cynicism and negativity stem from? And have people commented on them before? Genetic environmental mix, um, I would say based on the fact that I can even be this way in the first place, implies that the propensity for such traits existed in my parents' genome. So in the 46 chromosomes I got, despite their cheerful uh, predispositions by comparison, probably because boomers had it easier, right? Um, I had environments that brought out these other aspects right high school wasn't particularly good school before that was okay but um yeah losing my dad at 19 that really didn't help affairs so i would say that again the simple answer is it comes from that genetic environmental mix naturally peter parker says any new games movies or shows that have caught your attention lately Honestly, no. Um, my five favorite franchises, science fiction-wise, are Mass Effect, Halo, Shin Megami Tensei, Metal Gear, and um, Gears of War. I hear Gears of War is coming out with an open-world game, possibly, for Gear 6. Um, Persona 5 Tactica is coming out, so I'll probably play that in November when it comes out. I heard, I heard they're coming out with some other RPG. Maybe I'll check that out. Atlas, I'm talking about. In 2024, it will have been nine long years since Metal Gear Solid V. So part of me is secretly holding out hope that the whole Kojima-Konami split was a ruse. And they're going to pull some crazy shit after nine long years. I'm hoping, but they probably won't. Um... Halo, I've been reading books because, um, you know, I'm, kidding, I'm getting caught up. I have to read Outcasts. I have to read uh, Rubicon Protocol. Even a Halo fan, he released his own book called Halo Defiance. So I'll read that to hold me over. And Epitaph is going to come out next year. I also noticed that um, the young adult novel, the Battleborn series, they're republishing those next year 
under the uh, Simon & Schuster book label. So that's making me think that maybe Simon & Schuster might give the author of those books her third novel. They might let her publish it. That's what I'm secretly hoping they let her do. But, you know, maybe, maybe not. A man can dream. Um, it seems like most of Halo nowadays is being told in novels, to be honest with you. Which, again, I don't mind it. But, you know, I would like to see a, a, another Halo game. For sure. Um, whether it's an RTS. Um, if there is a Halo Wars 3, I think they should go with the pitch. Um, the space battles. I think they should do that. That would be fucking awesome. Um but um for the next first person shooter i would like to see um kind of all the factions and stuff that they've been talking about in the books just see them all like come together in one game that might be too ambitious though we'll see what they come up with 343 has not built a lot of goodwill lately and mass effect we're waiting on the new mass effect but you know it's been kind of crickets with that outside of that um I mean, probably the only other series I'm really looking at is Dragon Age. I'm waiting for the Dreadwolf. I'm pretty invested in that story, so I kind of want to see that game. But other than that, not really. Um, that's games, though. Movies, not so much. Shows, I've just I've been watching Suits lately. That's it. I watched it for the first time. It's a pretty good show. And then there is no sanctuary. Why aren't you invited to gatherings? So the running joke... <clears throat> is that uh, I tend to speak in a very long-winded and meticulous manner. And sometimes when you're just dealing with a lot of neurotypical people, they just kind of look at you like, who invited this guy? Like, who the fuck is this guy? Get him out of here. So the running joke is just kind of like, all right, this guy doesn't get invited to gatherings because every time he comes to a gathering, he just can't socialize like a normal neurotypical person. He always has to go in-depth with some deep philosophical conversation or scientific conversation or some shit like that. So yeah, that's kind of where I um, where I got the name from and why I'm not invited to gatherings. Okay, so those were all the comments. I'm going to refresh one last time, see if we have anything new. Let's see. There's nothing new. So that's pretty much the Q&A for this month. So feel free to leave a like, feel free to leave a dislike, call me an asshole, whatever you do. Don't report the video. It's good information and it will help someone even if it doesn't necessarily help you. If you're enjoying the content, hit the sub. If not on sub, it's all good. As long as you get your info somewhere, fine with me. Hit the bell icon. I hear it helps helps out the algorithm, but who knows? A lot of algorithm suppressants in the system. But hey, it doesn't hurt to hit the bell if you want to get notified when I do intermittently uh, upload or post. Um, but other than that, the purpose of this channel hasn't really changed right we're trying to stop men from self-deleting we're trying to help them out of the nihilistic valley help them see a different way to live life and hopefully these kind of videos offer that support to help you realize you're not in the trenches by yourself even though it definitely does feel that way sometimes uh, we're here to give you the comprehensive information you need to kind of re-enter the world with new eyes if you will from an unplugged perspective and women that are watching if you are learning something insightful and useful, I encourage you to subscribe and like the video as well. And I hope you have learned something useful in terms of, you know, some insight into what it's like to be a man in modern times. As always, I am that guy, Pete, signing off. I'll speak to you next time. But for now, you take care. Bye.